Um, thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, so we're going to change the pace a little bit. We've just seen some absolutely awful images of complete destruction. Um, but uh, today I just want to talk to you about uh, a project uh, that we're um, leading in the UK, which is very kindly funded by the Lithium Trust and the Science Technology uh, Facilities Council, which I do need to acknowledge because, thank you, I'm here thanks to them. Um, but what I really want to talk to you about today is partial destruction. So, as I said, a lot of the focus has been on uh, complete destruction of, of the heritage, and uh, that makes it quite uh, difficult to, uh, to restore, as we saw. There's a lot of rubble that we just don't really know how to deal with. But another thing that has been uh, cropping up more and more is how ubiquitous small-scale destruction is as well. So we can talk about uh, things like sledgehammers and uh, vandalism along those lines, uh, but also uh, gun violence. The uh, impact of bullets may not be a huge, um, a huge event where you know, the whole building comes tumbling down, but it's something that we see everywhere, not just in current conflict zones, but we see it around the US quite a lot as well. Um, there's quite a lot of scarring in uh, all around Europe. So I looked at it and thought, hang on, we don't actually know enough about this. Uh, so this project very much focuses on what happens when a bullet, whether intentionally or not, hits a heritage site and then causes that little bit of destruction because a lot of little bits of destruction adds up to a whole lot of destruction. Um, so we're working with quite a few partners. Uh, the Department of Antiquities in Libya has very kindly given me permission to share a few photos from Sabratha. Now, these are slightly uh, bigger ordnance than the ones we're currently studying. But I just wanted to draw your attention to the complexity of this sort of impact. Um, you can see that uh, around these sites, there's quite a lot of uh, shrapnel impacts um, and also little bullet impacts as well. So how do we deal with that? Because actually this is a conservation issue. So the problem is that obviously as a small team of researchers, we're not really allowed to go into active combat. Um, <laughs> I tried that, to, to have that fly with uh, HR and they basically turned me down. Um, so instead what we do is we take the principle of bullet impacts and we create controlled conditions where we can just study what actually happens at the time of impact, but also how do they then respond to environmental stresses afterwards. So to cut a long story short, what we do is order a whole lot of stone blocks, take them to the shooting range and shoot them. And that gives us a lot of samples to work on. So uh, here you can see uh, one of the, the sites, uh, one of the uh, blocks that was shot, a very nice limestone block. Um, most of what we're using is uh, semi-automatics because they're so ubiquitous in armed conflict. Um, and what you can see is that there's quite a lot of damage to the surface in this case, but how visible that damage is varies from block to block. Um, but we also now, having done some more testing, realized that actually a lot of the damage that is caused by these ballistic impacts is actually below the surface and invisible to the naked eye. So a couple of things that we learned. Uh, first of all, <laughs> how a block will respond is very much dependent on the type of stone that you're shooting. So this is the uh, same type of ammunition. Uh, so this is a, a lead cord Yugoslavian uh, projectile. And you can see here, sandstone block, uh, a little bit of an impact. But then the limestone responded very, very badly indeed. And that is actually very helpful because if we're studying sites from a distance, just knowing what the site is made of will already give us a clue as to how badly it will have been affected by the ballistics that uh, have been uh, flying around there. The other thing uh, that we found is that a lot of it depends on how something is shot. So it's, if something gets shot straight on, as you can see here in the image to the left, um, you get a nice crater formation. Um, here the image to the right, this was shot at an angle of 45 degrees, so basically someone is standing at an angle trying to shoot someone over there and hits the wall instead. And you can see that the, the shape that this damage takes is very different again, and here you can see the bullet actually lodged into the stone face. And one of the reasons why this is such a concern is, for me as a geomorphologist, what I study is stone weathering. 
So what I'm interested in is how do these stones actually respond to environmental stresses? And as far as I'm concerned, the bullet impact is just an extremely rapid deterioration process. So if we look at it from that point of view, what we see here is uh, some uh, blocks that were saturated with a saline solution and found that, for example, the crack that you see down here, the salt goes absolutely bananas for it, loves it, it attracts that salt. Which means that where we have bullet fractures running through a heritage structure, what happens is it becomes a lot more vulnerable to environmental deterioration in the long run. So again, it becomes a conservation issue. So you can see here on the right, there is uh, a nice profile that was done where you can see how that salt is sort of slowly moving through the block, but very much preferential to that crack formation associated with the ballistic impact. Another thing we learned is that actually a bullet, yes, it creates a little impact crater, but when you start looking at it at uh, a much higher scale, a high, higher resolution scale, we see very different responses. So this is uh, the right at the center of an impact. So imagine this is the impact that we're sort of building up. So right at the center, we can see here, that is a sandstone which has some quartz and it has a clay matrix sitting around it. And it is slightly jumbled up, but moreover, it's all compressed, it's all pushed together. So ironically, at the point of impact, where a bullet has hit the rock face, where you get this really high energy moment, the rock becomes a little stronger. It becomes compressed. Now, if we go slightly out of, outside of that, we get a very different image. And we're talking moving maybe an inch at most. Here again, there's a nice uh, quartz crystal. And it's just been uh, cut clean in half by the stress coming out of that bullet impact. And that's very odd because quartz is hard as nails. There's a reason that we find a lot of sand around. Sand's usually the last thing that actually still exists once a rock has weathered down. So to actually find it just cut straight in half is pretty astounding. If we go slightly outside of that zone again, and we're moving away from that impact center, we found something that's actually really quite worrying when it comes to conservation method, methods. Because what you see here, that looks a lot like candy floss, is actually a clay matrix. And these are all individual little clay platelets that have been pushed apart by the stress of this bullet impact and have completely lost all coherence. So a lot of the strength of this stone block has been lost by that stress moving through there. And then if we go slightly outside of that zone again, uh, you can see that what we st instead get is plucking. So the energy that is moving through this stone is actually moving quartz out of its clay matrix. So it's actually just working with material rather than going straight through. And so this may all seem like, okay, well, it's, it's sandstone's a bit homogen uh, uh, heterogeneous, but this is all happening in the area of one bullet impact, so that size. So if you're a conservation expert, how do you deal with this? And that's been one of the ongoing questions. How do we deal with the complexity that we now associate with ballistic impacts? And bear in mind, these ballistic impacts are absolutely everywhere. Buildings are riddled with them, and we just don't really have the resources to address them properly. So what we've done is try and distill three things that we've learned from these tests. And um, these we can use to actually train people up who are dealing with these impacts in their own heritage sites. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. So first of all, when rock surfaces are badly damaged via weathering, bullets can actually really punch through the material, through the deteriorated material. And that obviously is a big problem for heritage because these are sites that have been exposed to the elements for 500, 1,000, 2,000 years. So that is an already fragile surface. And when a ballistic impact happens, the sites that have been exposed for a long time will respond even worse than the sites of slightly newer sites. What we do get, however, and this might be quite familiar to uh, the archaeologists in the room, 
is sometimes you get uh, case hardening, as it's called, on a rock surface, where the um, mobilization of minerals within a rock actually creates a nice crust on the surface, a nice patina. And that can actually be quite protective. So what a bullet does um, depends very much on the state of the rock that it was in before it was hit. Second off, um, and I sort of hinted at that earlier, the angle of impact. So how a, a surface is shot is going to dictate, for example, what shape the damage takes. So you can see that here. This was hit an angle coming from slightly below, and it's blown off this whole surface. So how that stress is going to move through the stone surface and how that sh what shape that damage then takes is very much dependent on the angle at which a bullet hits a rock surface. And this is something that uh, we found in field testing in Southern Jordan, where we had some lovely, uh, very fresh AK-47 impacts. Um, these were about uh, two weeks to a month old at time of measurement. And again, you can see here, this was hit at an angle, and there's a lot of damage around here. These were hit straight on, and the damage is more sort of contained in subsurface. And this kind of confirms what we've already been finding out with testing. Here you can see a, a block that we scanned uh, with a CT scanner. The red is the impact area, and the green is everywhere where that stone has actually lost a lot of its original density. It's actually become looser, it's become more vulnerable. If you look at this, you may think, oh well, what kind of bullet would that be? Actually, this is a .22 lead caliber bullet. So this is like, very little, it's like rabbit guns, really. Um, and that already does this sort of damage. So that is the damage that we then expect to sit underneath these types of impacts. Whereas here, this damage is much more likely to be far more superficial. Um, and of course, third, um, <laughs> firepower. And actually, one of the reasons why I, study, I started studying these impacts is because weapons are getting stronger and stronger. There's a lot of active development. Actually, talking to, for example, the Ministry of Defense is moderately terrifying. Because they'll just casually mention what they're doing uh, with things like bullet and, and gun development. So that actually poses a real issue because people ask me, oh, why don't you just study historical impacts? Because that gives you a really nice uh, way of comparing, like, what does it do when it's exposed to elements? But it doesn't work anymore. Because what we're dealing with now is fundamentally different from what we were dealing with in, say, the 1880s. So modern weaponry that penetrates quite a lot further into any given surface and does quite a lot more damage. Um, here you can see a standstone block that again was hit with an AK-47 and it's just been cut like clean in half. So this is substantial firepower. And using those three lessons, uh, what we did is actually do the important thing, which is making sure that this sort of science is useful. Um, so I had the opportunity to team up with Training in Action and what we did was actually develop uh, packs that sort of distill those questions down. So what are you looking at? What is the state of the surface? You know, on a scale of one to five, what does it look like? And it's just using pictures, so you don't actually need extensive training to use these things. It's just hold up the picture. What does it look like? Um, so here are uh, the trainees from uh, Libya and Tunisia putting this into action. It actually was remarkably efficient. Um, the other thing uh, that we did is participate in army training. So these are the new monuments men units. And uh, a lot of my uh, job, and this is me looking extremely serious for the photo, um, is you know, talking to them about damage and getting them um, into a state of mind where they're aware of damage. They see what's happened and they know how to shore it up. So short-term solutions. And again, we're using these assessment sheets. So I just wanted to flag one up. Um, which is case hardening, as I showed you in an earlier slide. And you can see here, it's just, you know, nothing here, lots here, and then there used to be lots here, but it seems to have weathered away. And it is just a very simple scale. So using these sorts of approaches helps us to make that leap from extremely complicated science into something that is actually usable for people who need it on site, but may not have years to do the training and may not have access to all the equipment that we have. So to summarize, uh, type of, um, the ballistic impact is dependent on the type of ammunition used, the type of stone, the condition of the stone, and the angle of the impact. 
And that really helps us to understand how vulnerable these services now are to deterioration and what challenges there now are for the, for the conservation community to actually preserve these damaged sites. Um, so hopefully, by recording this damage and then helping to understand you know, what is actually going on in the subsurface, we can try and get sustainable conservation methods into uh, these uh, areas that have been affected by ballistic impacts. So I said, doing a lot of the work along the way on uh, preventative protection, so working a lot with Blue Shield, for example, uh, museums, and in part I train the army because that gives me the opportunity to say, don't shoot stuff, it's bad. <laughs> this is how bad it is. Let me show you some pictures to make you feel super guilty preemptively. Um, and that seems to be working, so that's good. It's all about the guilt trip. Uh, then uh, damage reduction. So a lot of what we can do is also just by looking at pictures say, well, this is really not stable. Um, this really needs to be shored up and actually that's probably fine. So we can actually play a role in triage as well. And then uh, a lot of the uh, sort of, this is very much exploratory work, but actually working with the legal community because Obviously, shooting a building and deliberately damaging it is a crime against culture. So we can help build up these legal portfolios uh, if we can uh, gather the right evidence. So that's still a little bit of work in progress. So that is just a brief overview of uh, what we do on this project. Um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, my PhD student, Oliver Campbell, who will give you a bit more detail on our actual sort of science-y bit, um, so you know exactly how we came to the conclusions I've just given you. So thank you very much.